Welcome to today's Ethnic Media Services Zoom news conference. I'm Pilar Marrero, Associate Editor for Ethnic Media Services. The bloody conflict now underway in Israel and Gaza is escalating fast. Many fear it threatens a broader regional war with troubling and unknowable ramifications. Meanwhile, social media is inundated with horrific images of the ongoing violence, some of it designed to inflame anger and to cast blame on one side or the other. But the horror is real. According to experts, more Israelis died during Hamas' initial assault than on any previous day in Israel's history, including all of its wars. Dozens, some say up to 150 Israelis, are believed to be held hostage by Hamas militants. On the other side, the destruction currently being inflicted on Gaza and its civilian population is increasing by the hour. With talk of a ground invasion imminent and with few places of refuge for Palestinian civilians who are now under a stage of state of siege with no water, electricity, food, or fuel, and one million are being told to move from their homes if they haven't yet. All of this comes as acts of hate and bigotry targeting Jews and Muslims have reached record highs in recent years, particularly here in the US, where anti-Semitic and Islamophobic rhetoric have become almost mainstream, according to experts. Our panel will discuss the roots of the current conflict in Israel, what it portends for communities here in the US already confronting the impacts of hate, and whether the violence in the Middle East could ultimately deepen fault lines between and among communities here. I must add that since we decided to put this panel together, tension between groups in the US has already been reported, particularly in college campuses and of course online. Today, police departments across the country are mobilized, and I quote a story from the Associated Press, in response to concerns about potentially violent protests following an alleged call by Hamas for a worldwide day of solidarity. Also this morning, the Arab Anti-Discrimination League is reporting to have received calls regarding Palestinian nationals detained by ICE and or visited by the FBI. The organization said that the FBI has also visited multiple mosques today in different states as well as Arab inmates. It all contributes to a very tense feeling for many people here in our country and uncertainty about where it's all going to go. To talk about this, we have today Jamal Dajani, Palestinian American journalist and an award winning producer, co founder of Arab Talk Radio. He served on the San Francisco Human Rights Commission between 2009 and 2011. His interview was pre recorded by our editor, Peter Sherman, as Jamal is traveling to the region as we speak. Then we welcome again uh, Brian Levin, founder of the Center for the Study of Hate and Extremism, Professor Emeritus of Criminal Justice at California State University of San Bernardino. He is currently overseeing with Professor Shireen Sinar from Stanford research with the California Commission of Hate of which he is a commissioner. Then we'll have ST Chandler, organizing for Jewish Voice for Peace, Los Angeles chapter, and Fatin Harara, she, her, is a New York-based Palestinian community organizer, having organized with al Abda in New York, Palestine Return Coalition for 20 years. We ask speakers to speak slowly for our interpreters in Spanish, Mandarin, and Korean, and we ask reporters to enter questions in the chat, which we will address following each speaker as Tam allows. Our speakers are also encouraged to answer questions in the chat throughout the conference, if they can. We will send a video of today's briefing and expanded bios with contact information for each speaker to all participants later today. And now we will hear from our colleague, Hamal Tajani. He is a Palestinian American journalist and an award-winning producer, founder of Arab Talk Radio. He also served on the San Francisco Human Rights Commission from 2009 to 2011. Um, you can find a longer version of this interview in our website. Um, Jessica, please show the video. Okay. We're having a little issue with the video. 
have to um, reload it. Why do these things happen live? Give us a minute, we hope this works now. There we go, hopefully. I haven't seen any reasonable voices trying to stop the conflict. Uh, unfortunately, the United States and this administration, um, they have given the green light to Israel to keep uh, bombing Gaza. Uh, there are some calls uh, for negotiations and so forth, but uh, I've spent the past basically 18 hours uh, glued to the web and monitoring the media in the Middle East and the onslaught is ongoing. Uh, you know, uh, entire neighborhoods have been leveled off and uh, over, uh, you know, 300 children have been killed in Gaza. Uh, doctors have been targeted. Uh, seven, I think six report reporters, journalists have been killed. So, this conflict could drag other players. Uh, you know, the United States has moved its aircraft carrier to the Mediterranean off the coast of Gaza, uh, which is unprecedented. This didn't ha this has never, I think, happened before. They've moved there before near Lebanon during uh, the you know the Lebanese uh, war crisis. And uh, because I think uh, they are worried maybe that uh, there'll be other fronts, like a front uh, from uh, Hezbollah, that's uh, one example. And, and so this can expand regionally. It can involve the Iranians. It can uh, involve Yemen targeting uh, U.S. bases in, in the Gulf because they threatened, the Houthis threatened to do so. And also, we have an ongoing war uh, between Russia and the Ukraine. So it has a, a potential, a very devastating outcome. I've, I've spoken to several people on the ground, both in the West Bank and in Gaza. I've... Uh, uh, communicated through Twitter. Sometimes you cannot uh, actually speak on the phone. As of this morning, th there are few people who, who are able to communicate because is Israel has cut off water, electricity, which means the internet gets affected. So now, I don't know, the next 24 hours, if some of these people are able to, to communicate, but it's it's utter destruction. What's happening now is not happening in a vacuum. Now, the death of civilian on, on both sides is, is, is abhorrent and no one can, you know, say anything but condemn it. However, I don't see this being put into context. Why is this happening today and why it keeps repeating itself? So when you say, we want revenge, we want revenge. Well, then we're gonna go on for the next 100 years because for the past 75 years, Palestinians have not seen any advancement in negotiations or they have not realized any of their aspirations or, or, or hopes. And they are living under apartheid. Before we used to say the word apartheid, everybody used to get angry about that, but now you have Human Rights Watch. Amnesty International, Israel's own human rights organization, Beth Salem, they're all certifying Israel as an apartheid state. So if you, if you have people living under apartheid, what do you expect them to do? We've been seeing uh, the rise of Islamophobia and anti-Semitism for many years. Uh, this is not something new. Of course, we live in the Bay Area, and so you don't have... Uh, the cases that you'll see in other parts of the of the country and of course white supremacy i mean we've witnessed that during the trump administration and uh, white supremacists uh, chanting in, uh, in the streets uh, jews don't replace us uh, and so forth and and they are you know white supremacists are opportunists 
And that's my my fear from white supremacists is, is that they'll take advantage of any international event, be it in the Ukraine or now bet, uh, and between the Russians and Ukrainians or between Palestinians and, and Israelis to take advantage of this and and uh, foment uh, their hatred and anti-Semitism and, and, and Islamophobia. I mean, we're going to see some incidents now you know, during demonstrations, people are heated up and one side supports Israel, the other side supports Palestine. But if you look at statistically across the board, most of the hate crimes, anti-Semitism, uh, 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 attacks on mosques, attacks on synagogues, they're perpetrated, perpetrated by white supremacists. And when it comes to the... Uh, Palestine issue and uh, their uh, aspiration for freedom and independence. Palestinians have a lot of uh, Jewish supporters from Jewish Voice for Peace, who, you know, for many years, they have been uh, major critics of what's going on uh, by Israel and its apartheid practices. You have to distinguish this is not <clears throat> a religious conflict. It is not a, an ethnic conflict as it has been described by the media and, and others who like to see it this way. This is a territorial conflict. It's a it's a it's a it's a colonial conflict. Uh, you know, uh, if you have one ethnic groups, whether the Israelis are Jewish or they came from Afghanistan or China or whatever. Palestinians are going to see them as invaders. When you are driven out of your home in 1948, you know, and just come and, and got kicked out and live in the refugee camps, you're going to see Israelis as invaders. This has nothing to do with religion. There are extremist few, uh, and I've named some of those, who try to take advantage of religion and say this is about religion. It's not. And, and historically, uh, uh, Jews, Muslims, and Christians coexisted in the Holy Land for, for many years. Okay. Um, Jamal is obviously not with us. She's pre-recorded, so we cannot ask him questions. So I'm going to move to our next guest. Um, you can still drop questions in the chat if you'd like to send some to Jamal. Um, we can uh, let him know. And so I'm going to go to Brian Levin. Um, Professor Levin, thank you for being ready to take this call to participate in our event. I know you recently retired, so we appreciate your participation even more. Uh, there are many things that we are learning about this conflict from mainstream media, alternative media, social media, etc. It's the topic of the hour um, in the world, and, and that is understandable. There's also plenty of manipulation and disinformation going on as well. We wanted to come together to understand the impact that this conflict and the way it's reported, talked about, and the way it develops could have on ethnic communities here in the US. I understand you just had a law review article uh, that looks at historic patterns of hate crime in the US and around the world when international conflicts of terrorism occur. What did you find, Professor? Uh, you are muted, I believe. Okay. Uh, th thank you so much. Thank you so much uh, for having me. Uh, what I'd first like to say is uh, as we enter into this period, 2022, According to the research, and while I'm uh, while I am retired from Cal State, I'm still very active in this work and very active actually in in peace efforts. And I would encourage all of you who can to contact Dr. Izzedine Abulesh, uh, who who offers uh, uh, some wonderful uh, statements about peace and how to achieve it. He's up at University of Toronto in their medical school. Um, so let me let me just go back a little bit with respect to what happens with, res with respect to hate crime. Can we go to the next slide real quick? <clears throat> so we were already seeing an increase, uh, as, as you can see, in, in recent years. And in 2021, FBI data showed we hit a record. Let's go to the next one. 
here are overall hate crimes. And one of the things I want you to look at is uh, look at that red box in September of uh, 2001. Uh, that was the record uh, month for hate crime. And uh, we, we saw increases uh, against uh, Muslim Americans that was significant and historic, uh, as well as against Arab Americans. But at that time, the FBI put them in a category that was called an umbrella category called ethnic non-Latino. Now, if you also uh, look around the election time in 2016, that was a big high. And then in, in that last one, you can see in 2020, we had a lot of red and pink. Now, what I think is so significant is what we're seeing now is hate crimes are not only spiking, but they're more elongated in in their spike. If we could just move to the uh, to the next slide, just because I don't I don't think I have a lot of time here. That elongation you can see uh, at, at the right side there with the George Floyd uh, lynching. 9/11 went up, um, but six days after 9/11. President Bush spoke of tolerance towards Muslims, hate crimes dropped precipitously the next day and into the next year. So really it was that, you know, that month of September. Now what we're seeing is our hate crimes are getting more elongated in those spikes. If I could go to the next slide real quick. Here's the anti-Muslim hate crime. Very concerned. And I want, I, I just want to say that uh, I will exercise every lever that I can to make sure that no resident of California, irrespective of their faith or ethnicity, uh, uh, faces uh, hate crime. Uh, uh, I, I can tell you there is a, a, a significant effort going on now with, with many of us who are involved not only in interfaith, but also protecting those who have been victims of hate crimes and hate incidents. So, so there you go. You can see uh, if we focus on anti-Muslim hate crimes, uh, how much they went up. Look at that. Now, important to recognize, massive underreporting with respect to, uh, to hate crime. Most recent Bureau of Justice statistics studies show that now a bare minimum of overall hate crimes are reported by victims, but certain communities, particularly I would say immigrant, uh, foreign language communities, and others uh, are, 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 are far less likely to report. Now, if you look down to that other red over on the right side towards the bottom, uh, that was December 2015, and it came after the November 13th Paris terror attacks, but also the December 2nd San Bernardino attack, which affected our community. And what was interesting, and this is why it's so important to counsel civic leaders and faith leaders to tone it down. Uh, we, we had a barrage of anti-Muslim rhetoric saying that Muslims uh, shouldn't hold office. And, and these were from major party presidential candidates uh, after Paris. And as you can see, it uh, went e up even more in December. But then when we, we micro-targeted the research and we went looking at day-by-day -day ticks, we found a double-digit increase, uh, about, I think it was 23%, with regard to the targeting of Muslims and Arabs in, in, the, in the couple of weeks after the Muslim ban proposal, which came five days after the San Bernardino terror attack. So flip side, Se September 17th, 2001, and I just I didn't have the time to put all our data from that, but September 17th, 2001, President Bush speaks of tolerance towards Muslims, hate crime decline. We have a Muslim after a terror attack and almost the same period after another attack. Uh, and the San Bernardino attack was the worst violent Salafist jihadist attack to strike uh, the United States since 9-11. Uh, we saw an additional increase above the increase that correlated to uh, the December 2nd uh, terror attack. Let's, let's go, uh, 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 next slide please. So this, base, oh, by the way, I have a whole chapter in a book about Islamophobia and acts of, of violence uh, by Oxford University Press, where we took 30 years worth, worth of data. And this basically encapsulates uh, uh, what we've seen. Uh, it's really important because you have spikes that come up from these catalytic incidents and then the spin and invective around it. 
Uh, Anti-Muslim hate crimes uh, had a head and shoulder top from about 2015 to 2017, then declined. But then in the last uh, last couple of years, we've, we've seen increases. In our separate research, uh, we, uh, we found a 45% increase in 2021 anti-Muslim hate crimes in major American cities. Uh, FBI found 38% increase nationwide. Um, and we found another, about, uh, uh, I think it was about a, um, another 15% increase uh, uh, the following year in 2022 uh, for anti-Muslim hate crime. If we could just go to the next slide. Uh, then there's that head and shoulder top. Notice, by the way, anti-Muslim hate crimes, there were more of them in 2016 with respect to just the assaults uh, than what we saw uh, after 9-11. So, so uh, while there were more hate crimes after 9-11, assaults actually uh, um, uh, were more, uh, at least FBI reported, uh, in, in 2016 and 2001, although the numbers of hate crimes was more overall against Muslims in 2001. Let's uh, let's uh, move move forward as well. Anti-Jewish hate crimes. Hey, let's look at this. Okay, if we look in the upper left, uh, in, there's a box 147. Uh, that's that's March of uh, 1994. That was the worst month for anti-Semitic hate crimes of the decade. It was an 86% increase from the previous month. What happened? Uh, February 25th, there was the Hebron Mosque massacre uh, 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 by uh, a Jewish extremist. And uh, we saw shortly thereafter this, this big increase in anti-Semitic hate crime. We also saw a terror attack on a 16-year-old Jewish student in a van on the Brooklyn Bridge where he was killed and others were injured. So what I'm saying to you is uh, what we have is this, uh, this uh, terrible triple perfect storm that now occurs, which is uh, increase in invective online and it's, and it's worse now. Uh, we also see an increase in hate crimes, but we also see an increase in terror, uh, terror events. What we don't have in this chart, which I wish we had, but we, uh, this goes back as far as we have national reporting. Uh, but uh, after the Achille Loro incident in the mid 1980s, uh, we did not have national data collection. But Alex O'Day, and his anniversary of his death uh, was October 12th, just, uh, uh, just yesterday, uh, was murdered. Uh, by a bomb blast at his office. He uh, worked for the uh, uh, American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee. And that case, by the way, just sent a letter to the Justice Department, uh, signed on to a letter from the Justice Department just recently, uh, asking them to, uh, to uh, re-examine whatever evidence they have with that. Let's go on to the next slide. Can you wrap up within the next minute? Yeah, wrap up, wrap okay. up right now. Here's anti-Jewish okay. here's anti-Jewish hate crime. Uh, 2022 up 29% in major U.S. cities after a 59% increase uh, the uh, the previous year. FBI showed a 20% increase. That decrease in, in 2020 was because of the gathering restrictions. One thing I, I, that I'd like to diverge a little bit from our, our prior our, our prior guest. Yes, I, I do think that it is indeed um, a, a, a dispute that the cat that, that, that does have political aspects. But, but with regard to Hamas, in Article 7 of their charter, they specifically say the day of judgment will not come until Muslims fight the Jews, killing the Jews, when the Jew will hide behind stones and trees, and continues to say that, uh, that, they, that they would uh, kill Jews. Uh, we've also had similar statements by Hezbollah. In other words, what I'm saying to you is where, where Jews are not distinguished uh, uh, by nationality. Also, uh, the attack this past Saturday was the worst single day massacre of Jews since the Holocaust. That, that's our research. And now, unfortunately, uh, we, we are seeing uh, uh, deaths uh, in, in, in Gaza. And I would encourage you to reach out to my dear friend who spoke so eloquently about peace in times like this. Um, Dr. Isidine Abu Lesh, who's, who's called the Martin Luther King 
of, of the Palestinian people. He lost a large part of his family during one of the prior wars, and we try to work together to bring, to bring peace, not only between Israelis and Palestinians, but also to make sure that our Muslim brothers and sisters, our Arab brothers and sisters, our Jewish brothers and sisters here in California do not face this kind of backlash that we are girding for. Thank you so much for this opportunity to present uh, the best data that we have. Thank you. Thank you, and Professor Leving. Thank you so much. We appreciate you so much. Please stay around so we can uh, have more questions answered and have more of a discussion at the end. Um, I'm just going to ask you one question because we are running a little bit out of over the time. So, um, and well, this question has two two parts. So, what do you make of the language where he, uh, we are hearing from U.S. political leaders in the wake of the current violence? Um, you know. Um, on both sides, but mainly on the Republican side. Um, and also talking about what Jamal said earlier that most of the hate crimes uh, against Jews and Muslims are committed by white supremacists and white supremacists are the um, the ones that you know will try to make hate out of this. Um, do you agree with that? Well, uh, not... I, certainly white supremacists uh, are, are involved, but not everybody who attacks Jews are white supremacists. Uh, we have different types of offenders, thrill offenders who, are, who have shallow prejudices, but are acting on stereotypes, defensive reactive offenders, mentally ill offenders, and mission offenders. And uh, unfortunately, what we saw uh, in uh, May of 2021, uh, we saw um, a, near, a near doubling of anti-Semitic hate crimes in New York City, and we saw a quadrupling uh, in Los Angeles. And unfortunately, um, a, uh, a, a, uh, a certain subset of those offenders were in, were in fact uh, uh, people who were, who were uh, uh, not of European background. Uh, so that is false. When, in times like this, uh, there, there's, a, there's a pile on and 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 um, and and we see these uh, these uh, these kinds of incidents uh, occurring also, unfortunately, uh, directed from Muslim and Arab Americans to Jewish Americans. And by the way, uh, in non-criminal incidents, we 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 all, we also see the uh, the opposite as as well. But uh, uh, that's not true during times like this. One quick thing: this is really important. This is this is new. The scope of what's going on is new, the, the immediacy, the disinformation. So what I am saying is we have to reach out to all the communities. And I have been um, contacting uh, my dear friends in the interfaith community who are Arab and Muslim and making sure that they know that they are cared for and, uh, and will be protected to the best that we can do, as well as with the Jewish community. But that statement um, is 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 not entirely uh, not not entirely true. One other thing that I think is important to recognize: um, there there are obviously uh, legitimate aspirations for self determination, but there uh, for for the Palestinian people and statehood, which which I have been pushing for for some time. How, however, there is a type of Jew hatred that comes out during times like this. I am not saying it's from the reasonable people who we're all friends with, but I can tell you that online and in certain protests where we see where we saw someone, for instance, in New York, displaying a swastika on their phone during a protest, as well as dead bodies and laughing about it, that does nothing to assist us in our desire to have a free, uh, uh, established and autonomous uh, Palestinian state. It's retrograde to those efforts. And, 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 thank, and thank you very much. And, and, and one other thing, we did not supply the peace folks like myself, Dr. Abulesh, Hussein Ibish, American Task Force on Palestine and others with the kind of media support that we previously had. And what I would say is talk to the helpers, as, uh, as uh, uh, Fred Rogers would say, talk to Izzedine Abulesh, who has this record of, 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 of peace work. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor, for all your work and your passion on this topic. I now welcome Esti Chandler, organizer for Jewish Voice for Peace, Los Angeles chapter. Thank you for being with us in this uh, difficult moment. We understand your group supports peace activists in, in both Israel and also in the territories. And 
among Palestinians. Um, can you please talk to us about how you see this conflict affecting your work here in the US and the relationships between groups? Yes, thank you very much. Um, I, I also just want to note, uh, with all due respect to um, Mr. Levin, that the statistics being used uh, for about anti-Semitic incidents right now, unfortunately, are primarily coming from one organization, which is the ADL. The ADL is a Zionist organization, and therefore their criteria of what they consider an anti-Semitic incident are not akin to what many of us might consider. In fact, we are told from people inside that they use um, when there are uh, pro-Palestine conferences on campuses or speakers on campuses, that they consider those events to be anti-Semitic. I wish that we had better information so that people um, could track it even better. I am a very proud Jewish American. My family is Israeli. So right now I can say that Palestinians, Israelis, and all of us with family on the ground are terrified for our loved ones. And we grieve the lives of those already lost, but we remain committed to a future where every life is precious and all people live in uh, with freedom and in safety. I think it's very important to put the con uh, context to uh, what we are seeing uh, coming uh, on the ground, which we're not seeing in the mainstream media. Um, Gaza has been under uh, near 16 years of Israeli military blockade. Much of the media is reporting that Israel left Gaza. That, that's just not true. They, they just moved their defenses to the perimeter. So Palestinians there um, have been living under siege for almost 16 years now. The Israeli government might have just declared war on Gaza, but in reality, its war on Palestinians started over 75 years ago with Israeli um, occupation and uh, uh, systemic apartheid that has been acknowledged by all major human rights organizations, um, including Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, and even Israel's leading human rights organization, B'Tselem, two or three years ago now, released a report titled, This is Apartheid. I think it's also important to um, understand that for the past year, the most racist, fundamentalist, far-right government in Israeli history has ruthlessly escalated its military occupation over Palestinians in the name of Jewish supremacy with violent expulsions, a rise in home demolitions, mass killings, military raids on refugee camps, unrelenting siege and daily humiliation, and um, repeatedly storming the holiest Muslim sites in Jerusalem. I say this because the mainstream media isn't reporting on these incidences. So of course, what we're seeing now doesn't come out of a vacuum and reality is shaped by when you start the clock. Unfortunately, what we are seeing now is a, another mass expulsion, another Nakba, where half of the society of the two point two or 2.3 million people in Gaza have been asked to leave their homes from the entire northern half of Gaza or, or because Israel says that they are going to bomb. They've given uh, over a million people less than 24 hours or 24 hours to, to, to try to move amidst all the bombing and rubble and roads that have already been destroyed um, 
So right now we're terrified that what we are about to witness is, is a genocide. And I do not use that word lightly, but when you're talking about it in half of the population of Gaza being driven from their homes, that is the word for it. So what we are- ST, um, can you go back to the question about how this will affect your work and the relationships between ethnic groups here in the US? Sure, we're already seeing the effects of this right here locally on the UCLA campus. We're seeing that student groups are being, uh, people from uh, Students for Justice in Palestine are being doxxed on, on, um, on uh, social media. They're being, um, you know, th their, their ability to organize for years has been suppressed. Um, not being able to uh, secure spaces to do teach-ins. Um, you know, this, this happens not, you know, this is something that we see locally here in Southern California, um, but we see it on college campuses across the, uh, across the United States. Um, and, you know, there, like other speakers have said, there is much misinformation in the media that that drives this and so students and activists are are made unsafe uh i'm someone who has been threatened myself so it is vitally important that um that media entities like many of the people here um give voice to actual facts and to um and to give the uh, stages you have to Palestinians to, to tell their experience and their story. Because what we hear here locally in Southern California is there are constant attempts to, uh, to suppress speech by Palestinians, education about the history of Palestinians, um, and of the, you know, Israel's uh, original colonization, military occupation, and imposition of apartheid upon uh, Palestinians in, uh, uh, in Palestine. Thank you. Thank you um, so much for, for your words. Um, let's see. I There is a question here. Henrietta, do you want to ask, you, oh, for, before we go to, the, to that, uh, Brian Levin, are you still there? I think he stepped out. I wanted him to respond to what ST said about the data from the Anti-Defamation League that they supposedly use. Um, he put something, he put a response in the chat, but I think he stepped out for a minute. Okay, let's go, um, let's go with a question by Henrietta. Henrietta, I wanna ask you a question about Harvard because what ST was talking about, it's kind of the opposite. In Harvard, there is a complaint by Jewish students uh, about the statement that university groups uh, put out and there's this whole um, uh, allegation that uh, Jewish students are, being, are, are afraid and they're, they're being uh, you know, attacked on social media, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Brian, I don't know if you have any comments on this and also please respond to what Mrs. S.T. Chandler said about your data. Um, we're not the ADL. If you're against stereotyping, don't stereotype research. We conduct our own independent, if I may. I've been doing this for 38 years and my fingerprints are on every anti-hate piece of legislation from the Hate Crime Statistics Act on forward. And our research was using the promulgation of it. Uh, now there are certainly issues with regard to, uh, to how government collects data and things like that, but our data, is collected independently. And it's been used by groups from, uh, from across the spectrum, from CARE uh, to, to various Jewish groups and, uh, and, and government places. We, we have a, a proud history of being for peace and, and being an independent place for data. And that's why I always check out where, where you get your information from. Uh, we, we collect it, we disaggregate 30, 30 years of it, and we have not taken a dime of outside organizational money from anybody. 
or, or, or big donors for that matter. There's one guy who held a birthday party and sent the stuff. But I self-funded to the tune of tens of thousands of dollars this research just so we couldn't be uh, cast aside as being for one interest group or, or another. And uh, and uh, we, you know, we've been we've been <laughs> we've been we've been, we've been pr promoted in in some uh, hate media as being Islamist and uh, <laughs> uh, and taking money from care, and we've also been accused of other things. We're independent, and and there's there's a there's a place for that. That that being said, I've I've also seen folks on on campuses over the years like Abdel Malik Ali. Who, who used horrible stereotypes and conspiracy theories uh, about about Jews, saying the Matthew Shepard James Byrd Hate Crime Act was was uh, passed to silence Palestinians. So what I'm saying to you is, at times like this, open your eyes and be careful on various sides, because there will will be people who will use the uh, emotional impact of what is happening to promote falsehoods, uh, and, it, and it happens across the spectrum. But I stand by our data, and what it shows is, at times like this, uh, we I think we have a double-pronged threat. Number one, when, when there are uh, tragic deaths of Palestinians, we see decade highs in anti-Semitic hate crimes here in the United States. Additionally, we see it across Europe. And I think that uh, that it would be nice as our friends at Islamic Networking Group go onto their website and look at what their advice is for educators. I think it's spot on, and and, and that is um, to, to understand. Please to let me understand to let us understand the grief that is affecting both communities, but also to highlight the voices that are truthful and that are non incendiary because that way we can try and contain as much as we can because anti-Muslim hate crimes hit decade highs when Americans are killed in international events as well. So we Thank have you, to Professor. double protect these communities. Both Thank you, them. Professor. Thank you so much. And we are not here to have a discussion over your data or have a back and forth on this. I wanna invite Fatin Harara. She's a New York-based Palestinian community organizer. Thank you for being with us today. Um, can, you, can you tell us how you see the impact of the conflicts on Palestinians anywhere in the world, particularly when we tend to see an increase in hate after events like this happen? Welcome. Hi, thank you for having me. My name is Fatin Jarara. And um, I apologize in advance. I'm, I'm not that organized uh, to speak. Um, <laughs> we've been dealing with a lot, obviously, here in New York as Palestinians. Um, but I have some remarks um, uh, in regards to some things that were said, but I'll also address the question. I think it's all related. I think that it's really important to remember the framing of everything that we say. And I think that even this, uh, this panel right now, um, the framing that it's using um, the Israel versus Hamas conflict is problematic to me because this implies that this is an issue between a whole nation of people and a militant group when it's not just that. This is an issue of occupation that is imposed on an indigenous people. Um, and I apologize also that I'm in a car because I was trying to find parking uh, and I was heading to the demonstration. And I'll, I'll uh, visit those remarks about our demonstrations here in New York um, shortly because we had one last, we had a couple last week or earlier this week and, and we do have one today that's happening in about 15 minutes. Um, so that I think is really important for us to remember. One of the things that we have mentioned, and I know that, um, the, the name of, uh, the Anti-Defamation League has been brought up as a source of, you know, whether it's the statistics that Brian Levin has used or not, I think it goes without saying that you, or maybe it has to be said because I, unfortunately we've seen that the Anti-Defamation League has been, um, uh, a source for a lot of people to do DEIJ work, diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice work, or, or any kind of affiliated work. I've seen it in my own um, workplaces sometimes where I've worked that, you know, the definitions that they use about racism and anti-Semitism 
and, and whatnot are the definitions that a lot of people like to imply because they seem to be some kind of authority about those things. However, as Este Chandler mentioned that this organization is indeed Zionist. This organization not only is uh, anti-Muslim and anti-Palestinian, it's also been uh, you know, recorded as anti-Black and anti-queer. And I'm not going to go into, you know, you can find the research. If you are all journalists, you can go ahead and, and find the research there, but it is there. So that is number one. Number two, the definition of anti-Semitism as adopted by the ADL and, and whatnot, there is actually a push for institutions and governments in the United States and Europe to adopt a definition of anti-Semitism that has been pushed by the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. And, and this is all relate, related to the point about what is happening um, against Palestinians locally um, and against Muslims, because I feel like Arabs and Muslims as well are adjacent to the community of Palestinians, right? The definition that the IHRA, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, wants people to adopt about anti-Semitism includes that any criticism of the state of Israel. So I, if I want to, you know, maybe I live in a place and they, my local government adopts this definition and I cannot say that I don't support Israel or I cannot say that, you know, that Israel commits war crimes, which is it does according to the international community on a regular basis that would be an offense, right? Like a criminal offense if I were to do that. So that is something that I think that we want to keep in mind because there's a lot of conflation when it comes to anti-Semitism, um, which is something that we have to consider, right? Um, so that's one thing. The other thing is, I mean, I was listening to, and to be honest, like we're very occupied right now, obviously. I mean, I appreciate that some of you have people on the ground um, and you are worried about their safety and you are here coming to speak your truth. Um, so I understand that everybody's uh, is mind is foggy, but I was listening. I think whenever people come up with the term terrorism or terrorist, my brain like alerts me. Okay. And I was listening to Brian Levin um, describe um, the uh, Hebron massacre, right, on the, the Hebron mosque, which killed 29 people. I didn't hear you call that man a terrorist. I don't even think that I heard you use his name. It was Baruch Goldstein. Meanwhile, you did say that there was one 16-year-old Jewish person who was killed, and you called that an act of terrorism. And you may have not done it in, in, intentionally, and I understand, but I think that's how deep this kind of rhetoric goes. You know, I study linguistics and I understand how deep this kind of rhetoric goes. So when you are out there talking about these things, it's really important to understand that manipulation of language, whether you intend for it to be manipulation or not, language is really important. And for me as a Palestinian, it's not my fault that the Israeli government insists on identifying as a Jewish nation, okay? I didn't choose the oppressor. I didn't choose the religion of the oppressor. I didn't choose the identity of the oppressor. The conflation of this identity, Israeli, Jewish, and Zionist is not my fault, okay? It is not the fault of my allies either. It's not the fault of Muslims, and it's not the fault of, of Arabs and anyone who is adjacent to the Palestinian community. In fact, we all know, because we want to bring it up when we talk about whether or not the, you know, the, the Jewish people have a right to the land, a claim to the land, they will always say, well, the only Palestinians really were the Jews that were living there. So they will identify Palestinians as Jews and only Jews, but they will not talk about any other Palestinians, yet they will certainly make the distinction when it comes to Palestinians versus Jews. And that's not a distinction I make. And I want to also make something very clear that oftentimes, like, you know, there's one of the problems that we have been seeing, especially recently, because I acknowledge 100% that what we have seen on Saturday is something that none of us have seen in our lifetimes. And it is something that took us all by surprise. It is something that when I woke up to personally, I was very surprised and I, I couldn't understand the scope of it. I couldn't understand how it was done. Okay. And I understand that it wasn't just the normal rockets that you know, Hamas fires or or, or whoever um, fires, whether it's like, for example, like from South Lebanon or, or wherever else, 
this was something different. This was more hostages that they have taken than ever before, potentially. One of the things about hostages is that I think it's like very clear that the Israeli government takes over, I think the number now is like 5,000, 180 or something of those children, those are hostages. But we never talked about them as hostages. We just call them prisoners or detainees as if they conflicted a crime or committed a crime, right? Whereas, you know, a child, what crime could he have committed? If, he, if a child or a she, if a child would have thrown a rock, let's say, or something, Okay, you know, maybe that is an offense in the, the eye of the Israeli government, but often these detainees and you should look up the resources like DCI Defense of uh, Children International and see how children are being treated. There's probably more children hostages held by the Israeli government than all of the hostages, including the settlers, including the soldiers that are held by the, palace, uh, the Palestinian uh, people right now. Okay, so that is something that I think people need to keep in mind. And that is something that I think people need to look into. And that is one thing. Now, I want to talk about like what has been happening on the ground. On my way here, trying to look for parking, I found a um, those uh, vehicles, you know, the vehicles that have uh, those screens, like, you know, whether they're for advertisements and whatnot. And what I saw was um, the the faces of, of Israeli children and their names, and I think their ages, and it says kidnap, kidnap, kidnap. And I mean, I could tell that this is what it was about because I, you know, I, I'm familiar with the situation. Um, yesterday at Barclays Center, it's a big uh, venue for concerts and, and basketball and whatnot. Um, there were people that were, uh, you know, uh, giving out I stand with Israel, uh, New York stands with Israel flyers. And and the push for, for the support is really high. But the thing is, I mean, I don't think in 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 the United States, you really need to do all that. All of the talking is done for you. I don't think you need to have that vehicle. And I don't think you need to have those I stand with Israel flyers because even the, the president of the United States without verification, okay, said that I'd never seen before. I never thought that I would see the day where I would see like photos of decapitated babies. And it turns out that he actually didn't see those photos, but he was willing to parrot that narrative because he is willing to believe that narrative. Whereas us as Palestinian, I just wanna make that really clear that I personally, and it's not that I wanna see this, I do not wanna see photos of decapitated babies, but as Palestinians, we actually have but footage after footage, I grew up on that footage my entire life of Palestinian kids and Palestinian mothers and Palestinian fathers. We have plenty of evidence, plenty. And we have to dehumanize those people that were killed just to convince the rest of the world that our people are oppressed and they're under a brutal occupation and a brutal colonization that doesn't just passively occupy, doesn't just passively, you know, keep people in, in, in the confines of the, the Gaza Strip and just have military checkpoints. And it's like, oh, you know, they don't like us, but, you know, we're so nice to them. We, 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 we're the only democracy in the Middle East. They have more rights than they would have under their own governments if they were. You know, we have to hold up dead babies with brain splattered to convince the world that this is happening to us. Yet Biden cannot even doesn't have to look at a photo of a decapitated baby for him to just parrot those lies. OK, and that's how deep the the manipulation goes in the context of the United States that you really don't even have to do all the work that you do. It is already done. The United States has never been on the right side of justice when it comes to liberation movements. You know, when it was Algeria and South Africa, Nelson Mandela was on the terror watch and the United States, I'm sure, called him a terrorist before they started to, you know, uh, celebrate him. Indigenous people here, I mean, this was happening on Indigenous Day, right? They were not being, you know, called heroes or anything until they were already, you know, exterminated off of their lands. And now all that we can say to Indigenous people on this land is happy Indigenous People's Day. 
So we have to understand, at least I, I know there's many people here who are not in the United States, but unfortunately, the United States does, um, you know, uh, control a lot of the narratives around the world. Um, Most people here are in the United States. Oh, okay. I, I'm sorry, yes. because I was looking at all of the different media. Yes, ethnic before. media so, here in the US. Know. Yeah. Okay, that's yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. Well, then you. Yeah, know, but can you wrap up, please, so we can go to yeah. questions? You know more than anyone that the this uh the and and you know I think that I I had very little time compared to other folks so let me just say the couple of things um that this is a very hostile environment here in the United States okay and and I don't have to convince you or have to tell you you are all journalists so you should know one of the things that you know what had been happening here is that a lot of people have been very afraid to go to school um for example yesterday at Brooklyn College a councilwoman went to the Palestine rally, showed up with a gun. She does have a concealed carry weapon because now that's a thing in New York City, okay? She showed up and that apparently is a felony to show up with a, even a licensed gun. But she thought that she could go to uh, intimidate those youth, the, the, the college students, okay? Scot-free because she is a white supremacist. And she supports Israel. She thought that she could go and do that to intimidate the youth and, and make sure that they know that, you know, well, what is it for? I mean, what, what are you bringing a gun to a rally for in the United States in New York? She was charged. She was arrested and charged this morning. And I was actually surprised uh, how quickly that went down because, you know, white supremacists actually get away with a lot in this country. So that is one thing. And, and, and I think that um, I know that Brian Levin mentioned the swastika. Do you know what the organizers say? Because I'm one of the organizers of the demonstration. First of all, we can't comment on every single person's actions. And in fact, when people from the pro-Israel rally side spit at us and hit us, okay, and call us things and threaten our lives, I don't go and say, wow, okay, yeah, those are individual incidents, but I keep them as such. They do not reflect the Jewish people. They do not reflect even the Israeli people, okay? They reflect Zionism to me and they reflect white supremacy to me. And so that is something that I need you all to, to keep in mind. And we don't condemn, uh, we don't condone having a swastika at our rally, but we also believe that that was actually planted by the New York Post because the New York Post has had a lot of uh, track. It's not a friendly uh uh, you know, a friendly publication to the Palestinian people in New York, they often come and they often incite violence against our protesters. Thank you, Fatin. Um, what, one question for you, what would you like to hear from officials here in the US regarding the issue of Islamophobia? Yes, I think that this is their responsibility because again, they had been parroting the same thing. When Palestinians have been, you know, being subjugated to the siege as uh, Este mentioned, right? It's a 16 year old siege on the Gaza Strip, okay? I think that even though, let's say before all of the bombardment, which has, I think since Jamal Dejani's video, that number has risen to over 500 children being killed. And I saw a yes. statistic that said, that the, in one week of bombardment on Gaza, more have been killed than in a year of bombardment on Afghanistan, okay? Um, so uh, this is the responsibility and this is the fault of the international community that continues to disregard and ignore the, the, the plight for Palestinians to just simply live a dignified life on their own land and have the right to return because that is the right that the international com community does think that they should have, but doesn't do anything to, to make sure that it happens. Um, and at the same time, this is the responsibility of the people who, like I said, Joe Biden, and uh, I can say for New York, Eric Adams and Kathy Hogel, who have not said anything about the 16 years, their words have been very you know, shallow when it comes to Palestinians. They didn't even acknowledge their Palestinian constituents. My own congressperson is one of the co-sponsors of the uh, the, legis the the legislation or, or, or the, the resolution that they want to introduce. I'm not even sure if it passed um, about condemning Hamas, okay? But in that 
to be honest, I don't even look at it sometimes because I am so angered by the lack of consideration and the alienation of our communities here as if we don't exist. And I actually challenge Mr. Brian Levin. I would love to see what are those, uh, those organizations that you work with because I think that is important for us to know. You know, you kept mentioning your friend, your friend, your friend. Maybe he's, uh, and you know, you said that he's lost a lot of people and he chooses not to hate. And, and I understand that, but that doesn't speak for a lot of Palestinians. A lot of Palestinians support resistance because when it happened with the um, Great March of Return, it was a peaceful march of people from Gaza who went to the borders and they were killed. Over 200 of them were killed and it was a peaceful march. So everyone who's trying to convince me hey, do you condemn what happened on Saturday? I wish that it didn't have to happen, okay? And that's what I would say to anyone asking, you know, because I think this fights the Islamophobia and this fights even the anti-Jewish uh, hatred that, that we see, okay? Um, because this, to me, is not a crime for, for a Palestinian to resist an illegal occupation, and an illegal besiegement on the people of Gaza. And I think that the Israelis are just as much victims as the Palestinians are of the Israeli government and its actions. Thank okay. you, thank you, Fatin. Um, we are over time, it's 12.01. Uh, if you wanna say something, Brian, very, very short, please, because we want to go to a last question for everyone. Uh, yes, uh, and, and, and that is um, Hamas is, an anti-Semitic group that has killed people. Israel has been involved with human rights violations and has violated international law. Uh, and, and I am hoping the occupation will end. But I can tell you that as a person of goodwill, occupation should not be a license to murder children. To, to, to take grandmothers hostage. And if you say that, that resistance extends to everything, then I respectfully say as someone who wants an independent Palestinian state that I disagree with you and I find it abhorrent. I, I find it abhorrent that uh, children are being uh, uh, hurt and killed in Gaza now. What do you have to say about the children that are being killed? I just told you 500 children were killed in Gaza in the past week. And, and here's the thing, a lot of people that- And I condemn with, that. A lot of people- But, but the brutality of- say, no, well, Hold on a second. The brutality of, 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 of shooting face-to-face -face people, burning them while they're alive. If that's the kind of resistance that you laud, I am off that train. You can be off and the I, train. And I condemn the deaths of children in Gaza as I don't, much as I, don't, I condemn the I deaths not see you as of an children. Okay. It, in, I in, in, uh, okay, 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 okay. We need to wrap this up. Thank you so outrageous. much. I, I, I appreciate that we can see the deep and in fault now is right here. Um, I think um, we wanted to know what each of you wants ethnic media. We have a collection of ethnic media from all over the US, from all communities who report in many languages. I want each of you to please tell us what you would like this ethnic media to take away from this, uh, just one minute or a minute and a half each at the most, thank you, because oh, we are over time. Brian? Brian, do you want to take your time? Ye yes. We have to get together, the people of goodwill, together and say that grief does not see ethnic or religious or national boundaries. And we have to work towards a, a meaningful elevation of the Palestinian people to, uh, to self-determination and statehood, and by the same token, protect all of God's children who reside not only in the Holy Land, but here in the United States. And it will be my effort to make sure that, that Palestinians Arabs, Muslims, Jews, Israelis, and others who are in California have their rights protected and feel safe in their day-to-day -day conduct. That must be the, the first order. That must be the first order. And, and again, I, I, I want to thank Fatin, though, for, for coming and speaking on, uh, on, on a topic. While I, while, I, while I abhor certain parts of what you said, 
we, we must acknowledge the dignity of, as human beings of the Palestinian people, whether they're in California, New York, or elsewhere. But I, I do not accept the glorification of violence against innocents at all, whether they be Muslim, Arab, Jew, or Israeli. Okay, thank you, Brian. ST? Yes, I want to echo um, what Fatin said, that it's not enough just to, uh, to say yes on both sides. It, it is imperative that we um, center Palestinian voices on their experience, um, go to organizations like IMEU that does that, and that if only our media would speak as clearly about the violence towards Palestinians that happens every single day that we wake up and see about settler violence and you don't hear it being, uh, being called terrorism. In fact, that's what it is. We have to, we have to start seeing every human life as equal in value. Thank you, Fatin. Yes, um, thank you for having me. And yes, thank you for saying my name correctly. Uh, I think that it's important to recognize that for us as Palestinians, we do see all lives of worthy of living a dignified life. Uh, before the creation of the state of Israel, right, we did harbor refugees from World War II. There were Palestinian Jews, just like there were Palestinian Christians and Palestinian Muslims, and they continue to live uh, and and what happened, which is the Nakba, as you all know, is something that Palestinians have been trying to resist in all forms, in all forms. It's not that I want to see violence. It's not that I want to see people, you know, losing their lives. But I want to see my people live a dignified life. I want to see my people liberated. And I would have backed the people who were fighting for their lives in the Holocaust if they had to employ any form of resistance against something that was terrible that was happening to them, against the extermination of those people, whether it was Jews or anybody else. And again, like I said, it is not my fault that my occupier and my colonizer and my oppressor happens to be Jewish. That is something that I think that a lot of people need to understand that we would have that stance. Hamas would say whatever it wants and Hamas actually makes a distinction. I put the link because you were, we have been employing the chat. I put the link of the charter that it makes a distinction. It's not us that conflates Zionism with Judaism. It's the Zionist state. It's the Zionist state that insists that this is an identity that is equal. And I guess, you know, it makes sense when you are Jewish, you can just become an Israeli citizen if that's what you want to do. And that confuses everybody else. So for me to say that I, you know, don't support Zionism and I support resistance against this very racist ideolo ideology that is super white supremacist to me. I'm not saying anything against Jewish people because there's a lot of Jewish people, I would say like Este and others who support my plight to just simply live free. Thank you, Fatin. Uh, thank you, Brian. Thank you, ST. Thank you, Jamal, who was with us. And thank you to all our colleagues to have covered this. Um, please let us know if you write something about it and send it our way. And thank you, everyone. <laughs>